Right, we're rolling. All right, oh, let's the go. Sun's, the sun's just come off for us. How's oh, my head looking? Yeah, it's beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> well, the sun tan lotion really works. It's like mine. <laughs> right, so where we're, we are at Chesley Street. Chesley Street. Emirates. Emirates Riverside, Riverside Stadium for England v New Zealand as part of the Cricket World Cup 2019. Absolutely. Does that sound good? La- uh, England's last uh, group game against. I-, I knew all this, obviously, been a very good. Uh, cr- oh, you're a cr- massive cricket, cricket fan. fan. <laughs> Do you know the difference between a four and a six? Well, I'm, I'm here for the nice corporate hospitality that you've, you've <laughs> kindly invited me as a guest. <laughs> so, whilst I've been here, I'm going against this fence. While we've been here, you've been telling me a little bit about what you do. Oh, look at that one, Mr. Hey! What have we actually missed? What have we missed? I think that's a wicket. Oh no. I think that's a New Zealand wicket. Oh, let's have a watch it on the television. Let's watch it on the television. It's good being next to the big screen. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. He's not happy about that, is he? He's not happy. This is looking very much like... So everyone's running over the big screen now. Oh, here we go. Big fast ball. Joffre Archer's bowled it. took a bounce. Ooh, that's oh, that's okay. Gloved it. Oh, really? Oh. Whoa. Hell of a catch. What was this? Nice catch. Who's that caught that? Josh Butler has caught that. I knew that. Oh, Joffre Archer. Thank you very much. I knew all about that. Right, so... Why are we here again? I don't know, man. Back to business. So, we've been having a chat and I said to you, Grant, what do you actually do? And I said, I'm not really sure. (laughs) (laughs) I thought that's the most difficult question you can ask someone like me. Um, Basically, I'm a currency advisor, currency specialist, currency strategist. Oh, that sounds good. All things <clears throat> currency related. Um, mm-hmm. I've worked for lots of different investment banks across the world. Dutch banks, Australian banks, American banks, Spanish banks. Um, and now I'm an independent currency advisor operating in the north and the northeast of the UK, trying to bring a bit of that special knowledge bit of fairy dust about currencies and <laughs> help my brethren in the uh, in the northeast well done so thinking about all them years in banking then yeah oh gosh. how many uh, sort out there 23 years 23 years i know 23 years as, as a complete banker <laughs> <laughs> i had to get that in didn't I? <laughs> yeah i've got to get it in brother Come on. so 23 years in banking as a complete banker yes. yeah and you build up all this fairy dust knowledge yes and you're sprinkling this as an independent now Totally independent, okay. yes, um, and uh, that allows me to sort of sit proud of any of uh, any of the banks um, and deliver, you know, advice that it's um, you know relevant price-wise and strategy-wise and thought-wise that works for individuals, works for companies, um, works for big conglomerates, whatever it uh, whatever it happens to be, really, and you know. Back in the day, that wasn't necessarily what you could do when you were in bank. You had to speak to various different corporates of, of different sizes, but you couldn't bring it down to a more grassroots level, and that's what I'm trying to do. So, as an independent, you could work with businesses who might, I don't like to say a manufacturer who might trade in from the UK to China or something, they might need to buy currency before they do like, How does it work? Tell us how it works. Yeah. Idiot's I, guide, come on. No, ab- ab- absolutely. So I suppose the, the sort of the, the easiest, the cleanest way to uh, explain it is um, importers and exporters, but it's really for anyone who has uh, any exposure overseas. You can probably look around this crowd now, mate, and absolutely every person in this crowd will have had some sort of exposure to currency risk. Um, at some time in their life, unless they've been living in a cave okay. um, in uh, in Chesley Street. What do you mean, stuff like PayPal, buying things on PayPal or something? Is that a thing? Yeah, buying think buying things on PayPal, uh, using your credit card oh, okay. abroad. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if you asked everybody in this crowd, how do you buy your uh, your holiday money uh, when you oh, go right. abroad? Yeah. Um, you know, some would say I buy at the post office. Some would say I use I don't know specialist firm like Marks and Spencers, others you know go into the airport and they haven't sorted themselves out they've only just packed last minute and they need to buy some currency and they'll do it in the airport there mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. and what's sort of key about talking about those different approaches to what you do with your currency is there's different rates that are put on your currency exchange at various different places that you do it and the worst of that being is if you go into the airport um, and you go and do it sort of there and then that's where you're going to get hit the most so you sort of transfer that thought process for, for an individual into 
the myriad of different ways you would do it as a, as a company, um, as an individual person of property abroad, an individual working abroad who's got you know um, money coming in that they want to send back to the UK, mm. um, people who might have pensions who've moved abroad and they want to pay their pension over to where they've moved abroad, or similarly if they've lived abroad and want to bring their pension back. You know, there's all sorts of different risks. So how, how does that work then for me, for the layman's guide? So I go into the airport, okay, and yep. I buy 500 quid's worth of euros. Yep. And I hand over cash or yes. my card and she gives me some euros and he gives me some euros. Yeah. Well, I'm going to sell my villa in Spain. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I want to take that money out of Spain and take it back to the UK. How, how does that get involved in terms of buying currency? Is it not just a transaction? It's a transaction, but it's it's a transaction with a transactional risk. So you might well have uh, you might have sold, you might have agreed to sell your property in Spain for I don't know two hundred thousand euros. Mm -hmm. You might have exchanged on it, mm -hmm. um, but at what point are you actually going to receive those euros? And in between the point that you've agreed on the sale price yeah. to when you actually take delivery of the euros, yeah. the sterling versus euro rate could have moved five. 10, 15% oh, right, okay. depending on the financial conditions. So could I not say it's 200, I, I want you to take the hit though? Like I want to come out with 200,000 euros? Well, let's let, let's say you, uh, you, you you fix the rate at the time that you, that you agree to sell a property and then and then, uh, and then the sale falls through. Right, okay. What are you going to do then? Yeah. Um, you know, you've got to come, you've got to come out of the exchange rate at risk, um, and you could have lost a lot of money. You might have made a lot of money at the, at yeah, the, at the yeah. same time, but it's a but it's a risk. And I, I think the point of what we're talking about here, why someone like me exists, um, is to kind of de-risk that transaction, um, give the transaction some certainty, and actually, you know, take it to the next level benefit from uh, any potential favorable moves in a currency uh, and basically you know get the best financial situation out of, um, of what your uh, whatever transaction that you're doing however however big or small so say I was a manufacturer yeah based in northeast of England sourcing a lot of materials from China and buying steel for argument's sake yeah and I've got a contract with a Chinese firm yeah who are going to provide me once a month with a shipment of steel yes what what could you do for me well, in that case, you know, you're looking at, um, you know, if you've got a schedule, you've got an agreed mm -hmm. schedule of, uh, of monthly payments, you can decide that you want to, you want to fix the rate today, mm -hmm. um, or you can decide that you may want to fix the rate as you go through the contract, or you may decide that you want to target um, a particular rate, um, and if the, you know, if the financial market hits that rate, then you're locked in. Um, you can buy financial insurance around that, it's known as a foreign exchange option. So you may not know how much steel you're going to deliver, there, 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 there may be some sort of fluctuation mm. within the steel price itself, there's things that you can do with that as well. Um, so you know, it's not as pure and simple as just saying, I am going to buy this steel and yeah. I am going to take delivery of this steel for the next six months. There's a whole load of different connotations. So within your role, then, yeah. Do you? Ha uh, what, what, what does that look like? Is that a? Is it an easy kind of solution that you provide, or do you have to dig into the organisation and say, right, okay, I can save you money here, or my ROI is like, how, how, how do you how do you go about what you do? Well, what I'd say about that is every single person uh -huh. um, has got a different. Uh, Approach. Every company um, has got a different managerial structure, decision makers, mm. um, and a different approach to risk. Um, That's a good point, yeah. Some may have been in business a long time, some may be relatively new to it, so that might restrict the things that they can do um, with currency. So, yeah, no one conversation around <laughs> currency is the same. Yeah. Um, and you know, so many times I've come across so many individuals, so many clients, corporates who have not taken into account the currency part of their uh, right. uh, their transaction when they've been focusing a lot on their core competency. Yeah, they've yeah, been, yeah. They've been, we were talking earlier about um, you know a, a, a Chinese uh, a Chinese uh, supplier of, uh, of textiles. You know, the UK company goes in there and negotiates um, negotiates the price on on the textile. But they haven't negotiated the price on the currency. They haven't factored mm. that in, mm. and actually, they end up 
losing the margin yeah, that they made yeah, on the yeah. negotiation really interesting, actually. by not doing the currency properly. So right. you know, ultimately, it's about de-risking the situation. But everybody has different drivers. Okay. Now, you and I talked earlier about um, a little exercise uh, that I do when uh, when I present um, to get everybody thinking um, mm. about currency and. Uh, you didn't want me to give you the. Uh, I didn't. I didn't want to the, know anything about it. I the, said, "Wait till we do the podcast, Grant, because <laughs> I, I want the audience to hear this." Because you were trying to tell us, "Like, stop! This is good stuff. <laughs> I want to record this, so go for it." So, here's your dilemma, mm-hmm. um, or here's your opportunity. Depends which <laughs> way you want to look at it. You've okay. given away. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if I was to, and I, 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 I do this to you know ver- ver- various different age groups, demographics. Mm-hmm. Um, if you had a pot of currency I put on a table now in front of you that was worth the exact same amount of uh, pounds right at this moment in time, yeah. which of them would you choose? And let's use you as, a, as, the, as, <laughs> the, the, guinea as the guinea pig here. <laughs> which one of these would you, would you choose? I'm going to give you £10,000 worth of dollars. I'm going to give you ten thousand pounds worth of pounds. Right. Okay. Ten thousand pounds <clears throat> worth of euros. Yeah. Ten thousand pounds worth of gold. Yes. Ten thousand pounds worth of bitcoin. Yeah. Which one of those are you going to take off the table, and why? Right. I'm going to de-risk this. Right. Right. I'm going to go with the pounds. You're going to go with the pounds. Okay. Good choice. It's ten thousand pound. It's ten thousand pound. That's how much it is, and that's that's how much it is in my pocket. But the but the but the dollars is ten thousand pounds as well, and so is the and so and so is the yeah. Euros. But I'm going to make a transaction to change it. In, still, no, I'm not. Well, n- n- not right, not right at this ah, moment right, in time. Okay. But, right. you, but you but but you but you but you may have to. But yes, sterling is a you know, you're, you're UK based. You're not doing any business overseas. Yeah. So you're going to take the pounds. Thanks yeah. very much. And there's a bar right across the road there. And I've got 10 grand in my back pocket. It's party time. <laughs> but no, so all the alternative is that I could say, right, okay, I've been watching gold. Yeah. I, I think personally it's on the rise. Yes. So then I think, right, okay, if I get this £10,000 worth of gold, tomorrow it might be worth £11,000. Do you know what the most common answer that I get to the question is? What do you think the most common answer is? Dollars. Wrong. Not Bitcoin. No, oh, Bitcoin, <laughs> Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Now there's another, there's another subject. We'll come on to that. Um, the most common on answer I get is gold. Okay, ten thousand pounds worth of gold. And when I ask the question around the room, yeah, the answer I get is, well, it's tangible. Yeah, yeah I yeah. can see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and say, so, well, but what happens if the price of that gold goes down? It can go down ten percent. It has done. Yeah, yeah. Quite recently, equally. The value of the pounds could go down ten yeah. percent, and so could the dollar. So, 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 those people who say gold, they like tangible, yeah. visual assets. Okay. You like pounds because you're not doing any business overseas. Other people might choose euros very often because they're purchasing product with euros. Other people like dollars because the dollars, the currency, so-called currency of the world yeah, yeah, and therefore has got the most longevity right. um, and then the younger more funky yeah. digital techie generation X's right. they choose Bitcoin right okay and that's so I, I generally get a split of like so 60-70% go gold um, the intelligent kind of industrialists go dollars um, the, uh, the people who never leave the UK just go to the bar, <laughs> choose sterling. Oh, God. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, the, you know, not many people choose euros, funnily enough, but I don't right. let's not get into a well, yes. debate. Well, yes, we've had a couple of Brexit um, podcasts, actually. Okay. So, uh, but we won't go down that route. So let's go down the Bitcoin route, then. Okay. What I mean, in terms of currency, then, yeah. and you being um, a specialist in currency, do you need to know much about cryptocurrency? Yeah. Well, it's definitely something you've got to be aware of, okay. and, and, it, and, it, and it, it is the future. So, sorry, do you remember what declines come to you and say, I'm interested in buying some, what's your thoughts? Quite regularly, Still yeah. It? And quite regularly, I say, don't touch it with a barge pole. Really? Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, you've got different kinds. What is it, Ethereum, and, and, and is that right? And, yes. And, and Bitcoin. And Ripple. So, and, yeah. yeah. So, what do people say? Like, crap, which one's the best one, and which one should I buy? Yeah. Like, they're all in. <laughs> well, my answer to that is, 
I don't I don't know which one's the right one to buy. Right. It's purely speculative. Okay. Um, what I'm uh, what I'm what I'm telling you to do, and I'm not going to advise you on something that I don't know enough about. That I don't have any sort of solid evidence to tell you what to do. You know, they are still very much a gamble. Um, and you tend to find that a lot of people who are buying this are buying it because they want to hold it and they think it's going to go up. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. of course, as we all know, Bitcoin has absolutely uh, collapsed last year, starting to come back a little bit now. And, you know, I'm not saying here that uh, the Bitcoin is not the future. Yeah. Um, it's just that I don't think that we know enough about it at this moment in time. It's certainly not something I'd be telling a, a corporate to buy Bitcoin to pay for your product um, in the future. Yeah. Um, because you just don't know, you know, how deliverable is that? Where where is it held? So you know, it's it's a, it's, it's it's a sticky wicket. If uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice pun. <laughs> so you know, is it so? It, it's a gamble. That's what we're saying essentially. So it's a, you know, if somebody was a gambler, then yeah. might they say, Grant, organise me twenty five grand worth of Bitcoin, and I'm going to sit in it and see what it turns into. Is that a thing? Is that what people want to do? Yeah. Okay. So they don't want to. They don't want to actually buy it to trade it or to or just buy something with it. It's to sit on it. Is that what they do? Yeah. I mean, nine times out of ten, those questions tend to co tend to come out of some form of uh, financial gain. Yes. And, you know. I mean, you, you, you could flip my argument uh, about and say, well, you know, if what what are you what what, what are you looking for? What sort yeah, of return yeah. are you looking for? 20, 30, 40, 50 percent. Yes. You know, generally, people in, with, with, with with any of these cryptocurrencies are wanting. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. I've, I've made I've made X amount of uh, yeah. pounds. Yeah. Um, but buying gold might actually be a safer bet, or right, okay. indeed buying sterling might be might be a safer bet. I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot here. What what is this? So we we've got 20 grand now in our back pockets. We've got to buy it. We've got to buy something today. Mm -hmm. We've got to sell it in a few days' time. What we're buying? What's going to give us the best return? <laughs> Look at that face, <laughs> you. So and so. <laughs> That's <laughs> really put me on the spot. Yeah. Um, I mean, personally. If I was looking for a quick turn, I'd be buying sterling okay. against, against something. I think it's just been sold and sold and sold, so right. it's all pre-Brexit. And, and actually, when it does recover, mm -hmm. um, there's uh, the, the, the short-term short, short opportunities. So yeah. that, would be, that, would be, that would be my point, because that's what I feel that I know most about. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking here then, it's about your yeah, appetite for risk. Yeah, I mean, you know, the question about those five different pots of, uh, of, of, of cash or, uh, or gold or Bitcoin, um, why I do that is to demonstrate the, the difference in people's thought process, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, approach, um, and, you know, my, my job as a currency advisor is to go in and understand what it is that is driving yeah. someone's decision making What's process. What's your why? What's your why? Yeah, yeah. And then let's look at what the currency exposure might be okay. and take your approach to it. You know, I, I have various different clients who have um, different approaches, different levels of, uh, of experience, mm. um, and have had different experiences with currency winners and winners and losers. So, but you know, generally what you're trying to do is take the risk of currency away to allow them to concentrate on doing what they do best yeah but not losing money doing what they do best yes no that that, 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 that sort of I understand sort of sums it up so what does the future hold for you then grant <laughs> so you've got all this knowledge right okay yeah yeah. What are we going to do with it? You're an independent guy. Yeah. What do you do? How do you find your work? Who do you, who could you work with? Who do you work with? What clients could you use? So um, I've built quite a big network of um, of clients, introducers yeah. um, within uh, within the northeast. Um, you know that comes from years of doing that yeah. with Santander and National Australia Bank, um, and um, and going in and um, yeah, just you know. Talking to them, understanding what their risks are, and uh, and, and, and and advising them, and, and, and putting them into the right structures, in the right banks or independent currency houses, whichever suits their profile the best. What do you, what do you think? I'm going to ask you a little bit of an economy question here. So we've got lots of um, 
young people listen to this podcast, lots of entrepreneurs, yeah. lots of in, you know, um, entrepreneurs who, get, who work inside businesses who might want to break out, maybe they'll have a side hustle yeah. you know, and create their own business. Yeah. What do you think the climate is like at the moment for people to want to jump into a, a new business and, and, and go for it? What, what would your advice be? Well, my advice would be if you're going to go and trade internationally, um, make sure you know which currency you're getting paid in because quite often you can be doing business um, you know in Barcelona or mm-hmm. Lisbon and um, the client that you're dealing with says that they're going to pay you in pounds and they give you a pound amount okay. my advice there would be agree your price in euros yeah. um, and t- you take control uh, of the exchange rate risk by Passing the exchange rate risk to someone else, it gives them control of it and gives them control of the price configuration and how they pay you. Um, don't allow there to be any sliding escalators in any um, international business that you're doing. What I mean by that is, you know, a, a client may tell you that they're going to pay you X amount of euros or dollars or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. However, if the price move, if the currency price moves, then expect to be paid a different amount okay. you know, just make sure that you factor in any currency risk before you agree a contract and of course you know with the way the world's going people are doing a lot more remotely and agreeing prices in China India yeah. Japan Australia you know there's so many businesses who have currency risk who don't address it yeah. um, and they're missing a trick Okay, that's my advice yeah so if you want to start a business... Is that good or, advice, do you think? No, I'm just thinking about if you're going to... It is good advice. <laughs> if, if you listen to this podcast now, is it a good time to start a business? 100%. When is a bad time to yes, start a business? that's what I'm talking about. Just go all in, just get it done. Just just go for yeah. it and just but make sure that you've uh, that you've, you've, you've thought about every What's angle? the worst that could happen? You've got to go back to your normal job. You've got to go, <laughs> got to go back and live with your mum and dad. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note... <laughs> so listen, we're at the crickets. What was the score, by the way? So England were at what? They were 3 or 5 or something in the first 50 overs? I can't remember. Well, at the moment, uh, the Kiwis need 268 to win uh-huh. uh, of 40 overs, which works out at around about 7 and over, um, and they've lost, uh, they've lost two wickets. What do you think, then? I think England are going to win by 20 or 30 runs. Right, we'll see what happens. Right, OK, thanks for listening. Thank you. Bye.